Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Aisha Zafar, a faculty member at the Canada School of Public Service, and I'm pleased to moderate today's session in our series on the future of democracy. I'm speaking to you from Burlington, Ontario, land which is part of the treaty lands in the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. These lands are rich in the history and modern traditions of many First Nations in the Métis, and they span from Lake Ontario to the Niagara Escarpment. I would also like to acknowledge the land upon which I was born and raised, where I met many Indigenous people and experienced their traditions growing up. However, it was not until I joined the public service that I truly understood the significance of these lands, the history of Canada and the Indigenous people, and about reconciliation. The land upon which I was born was a traditional territory of the Bisset, known as Thompson, Manitoba. And while I was born in Thompson and I currently live in Burlington, Ontario, you may be on different land or territory, and I really encourage you to learn more about the traditional lands of the Indigenous people of Canada. For the next 90 minutes, we're going to be focusing on the state of political polarization in Canada, an incredibly timely and important topic, which I'm sure many of us have thought about over the past few years. This is the second event in our new series on the future of democracy, following the first discussion on how governments can meet future challenges in this space. Before we dive in, I want to make sure that, as always, you have the best experience you can joining us today. So I have a couple of tips for you. Uh, today's event will be in English. Simultaneous interpretation as well as the CART, so that's the real-time captioning, is available if you need it and if you want to follow in the language of your choice. To access these features, just click on one of the icons directly from the webcast interface, or you can um, look at the email reminder that was sent to you by the school and the instructions are in there. To optimize your viewing experience, we also recommend that you disconnect from your VPN if you're currently connected to one or um, use a personal device so you can watch the session. If you're experiencing technical issues, uh, you know, great old IT trick, just turn it off and relaunch the webcast link that's provided to you. It usually does the trick. During the event as well, you may submit your questions at any time by pressing the raised hand icon, which is on the top right hand corner of your screen. We have planned time for question and answer period, and it's going to be a, a lot of really interesting information. I'm sure you've got some questions, so make sure you submit them as you think of them, and I will do my best to get to them for you. Okay, so let's jump into this because there is so much that we can talk about. We are going to start off today with a presentation by Eric Merkley, Assistant Professor of Political Science in the Department of Political Science at the University of Toronto. He is going to share with us his research, which broadly focuses on the relationships between elite behavior, news media, and public opinion, particularly as they relate to issues of expert or scientific consensus. So think about all of the stuff that's been going on, you know, in the first couple of years of the pandemic. He's also currently working on a book, which I'm really looking forward to reading when it comes out, because it's going to be on political polarization in Canada, something that I know many of you have probably talked about with your friends or colleagues or at the dinner table. Um, and looking at the data and researching this topic, which really hasn't been done before, um, we're all really, really looking forward to hearing more about that. So without further ado, welcome, Eric, and thank you for joining us today. Good morning. Uh, my name is Eric Merkley, and I'm an assistant professor of political science at the University of Toronto. It's a pleasure to be invited here to talk to you all about the state of political polarization in Canada, which I think is a super important topic and one that's quite timely because there is a nagging sense that things have changed over the last decade or so. Some folks have raised alarms about growing polarization. For example, Akash Maharaj, CEO of the Mosaic Institute, notes that the moderate middle has largely disappeared. Increasingly, political rhetoric is used to incite rage against opponents and fear of electing another party. And Susan Delacourt of the Toronto Star writes that people are absolutely convinced they're right and everybody else is absolutely wrong. The middle is the scariest place to be in Canadian politics. Plenty of other pundits have alluded to similar themes, and, and I'm not just cherry-picking helpful anecdotes. I downloaded articles focusing on polarization in the big three newspapers. This graph here on the screen shows us that there has been a sharp rise in this topic over the last decade or so. And the common thread throughout all these accounts is a belief that Canadians might be polarizing just like Americans. So for the rest of this talk, I want to unpack the narrative here. Are Canadians polarized? Are we polarizing over time? And if so, what are the consequences of this phenomenon, and what can we do about it? 
I'll present eight findings related to these questions for the remainder of this talk. The first finding that I want to draw attention to is that people who support political parties increasingly do dislike parties and their supporters that are their ideological opposites. That is, for example, conservatives increasingly dislike the NDP and Liberal Party, and vice versa for NDP and Liberal supporters. This is what scholars call affective polarization. And we can see this in Canada by using feeling thermometers. This is where we ask survey respondents how warm or cold they feel towards political parties on 0 to 100 scales. These can be found in the Canadian election study. I'm going to be using this a lot over the course of this presentation because it's the best academic study out there that allows us to observe changes in Canadian public opinion over time. This graph on the screen will plot the average feeling thermometer score, that's 0 to 100 scale, for one's own party that they support and their ideologically opposing party. So, for instance, for Liberal and NDP supporters, that would be the Conservative Party and vice versa. Across elections, which are on the x-axis. And as you can see here, we have seen a steady decline in people's feelings towards opposing parties, along with increasing warmth towards the party that they support. And it's important to note that this has been a very long-term process. It's not confined to the Harper and Trudeau years, nor is it confined to the social media era. This has been going on for decades. One potential cause of this growing inter-party hostility it leads me to finding number two. It turns out that NDP and Liberal Party supporters on the one hand and conservatives on the other increasingly disagree with one another about the proper role of government in the economy and in social life. That is, they're becoming ideologically dissimilar. And this is what we tend to call partisan polarization. You can also evaluate this phenomenon using the Canadian election study. Here I use a question that asks our survey respondents where they would place themselves on a 0 to 10 scale from left to right. Here I calculate a statistic that tells us the dissimilarity of responses to this question between two pairs of parties, say the Liberals and the Conservatives. A value of 1 means the two parties are perfectly dissimilar from one another, and a, and a value of 0 means they overlap perfectly. And we should expect to see an upward trend in this statistic if there was growing polarization between any two parties. And this is exactly what we see. The ideological differences between the Liberals and Conservatives have increased over 100% since 1997. The Conservatives and NDP have also become more dissimilar, but they were already pretty dissimilar to begin with. And at the same time, the Liberals and NDP have converged over time in their ideological beliefs, signified by that downward trend we see on the graph. But, and this is a big but, there are three important caveats to this polarization narrative. First, Canadians aren't actually becoming more extreme in their beliefs. Now wait, I, I just said that ideological beliefs of conservatives on the one hand and liberals and the NDP on the other are diverging. Isn't that a sign Canadians are moving to the extremes? It's important to note that that's not actually necessarily the case. There are a lot of Canadians that don't identify with political parties. And people could change their partisan loyalties to better match with their pre-existing ideological views, rather than changing those views themselves to become more extreme. So I use 0 to 10 ideological self-placement scales, that measure that I just used before from the Canadian election study. Here, I calculate something called a bimodality coefficient. This will tell us whether people are starting to cluster at the extremes of that 0 to 10 scale. 0.55 on this scale is the threshold for bimodality, and it runs from 0 to 1. And what we see is that there's very little movement over time. If you squint really hard, perhaps you can see on the graph some initial depolarization that's been reversed since 2008. But the low numbers also suggest a very unimodal distribution. And what I mean by that is that Canadians are clustering at the center point on that 0 to 10 scale. They're moderates. There's no evidence of the growth of the extreme left or right. 
The second biggest caveat to the polarization narrative relates to one of the most notable characteristics of U.S. polarization. That is, that Republican and Democratic voters have become increasingly socially distinct. Evangelical, high-income whites have clustered in the Republican Party. Non-religious, low-income, racialized minorities have gravitated towards the Democratic Party. These differences aren't just about policy or ideology. It's about something even more fundamental than that. And this is a process known as social polarization. So what, what's the story here in Canada? Uh, here I use data collected with the 2019 Digital Democracy Project. What I asked respondents to do is to identify different social groups that they belong to and how important these groups are to their sense of self, such as their region of residence, their class, their race, etc. And I examined how correlated those social identities are with the intensity of a person's support for a given political party. And what we see is that, on the whole, correlations between social identities and partisan identities are, on average, quite weak, with the exception of region of residence. And they're much weaker than what we see in the United States. So that's good news. And then finally, the last caveat I want to draw attention to is the reality that we actually think we are far more polarized than is actually the case. We tend to adhere to exaggerated stereotypes of political parties. We think that conservatives, for example, are much more wealthy, evangelical, and right-wing than they really are. We think NDP and liberal supporters are more left-wing, racialized, and cosmopolitan than they really are. In the Digital Democracy Project surveys, I ask respondents to give their best guess of the share of conservative, NDP, and liberal supporters that are members of certain social groups. These groups can be stereotypical. So, for instance, evangelicals are associated with the conservative party. These groups can also be counter-stereotypical. Visible minorities, for example, aren't typically associated with the conservatives. The graph I'm going to show you here is going to tell us the net error in people's evaluations. And what it shows effectively is that higher values indicate that people, people overestimate the share of partisans from a given stereotypical group compared to their estimate of the same counter-stereotypical group. So just as a, an example... How much do people exaggerate the prevalence of evangelical conservatives compared to their estimate of NDP and liberal evangelicals? And we see considerable evidence of bias across all groups. People exaggerate the share of party supporters from a stereotypical group by about 10 percentage points on average. These are very large differences, though not nearly as stark as what we've observed in the United States. So to recap, yes, there is some polarization in Canada. Partisans increasingly dislike and disagree with one another, but we're not becoming more extreme and we're not as polarized by race, religion, or class as Americans are. And finally, and also problematically, we think we are more polarized than we actually are. And these misperceptions actually matter in their own right. So this discussion brings me to the second part of this talk. Well, why does this matter? If we are polarizing, why should we care? U.S. scholarship has identified a number of different social, cognitive, and democratic consequences of polarization. I'm going to spend just a little bit of time evaluating the scope of a few of these problems in Canada, but there is much more work to be done on all of these issues um, in our country. Most of the research so far is done in the U.S., one concern that's been raised about polarization is that it may lead to social alienation. Um, and this is implied by affective polarization. If you really dislike your political opponents, you're just not going to be likely to engage with them in your day-to-day -day lives. This could undermine social trust and social cohesion, um, which is the foundation for a healthy market economy and for democratic life. So it would be a big problem. In the Digital Democracy Project surveys, I measured people's willingness to have opposing party supporters as friends, neighbors, or in-laws. From these, I construct an index of social alienation, where 100 is the maximum level of alienation, so another 0 to 100 scale. 
And we can see that alienation towards opposing party supporters, it does rival feelings people have towards Muslims. But on this index, it's still relatively low, about 27 on a 0 to 100 scale. So much closer to the 0, where there's no social alienation, than to 100. And these results are more muted than what we see in the U.S. So, for instance, 24% of Canadians would be upset to some degree with an opposing party supporter as an in-law, compared to over 40% of Americans. And this is implications for the relationships we pursue. Another thing that U.S. scholars have found is a striking trend towards political homogeneity in romantic relationships. And this is problematic because it could reproduce polarization through generations when children are politically socialized in increasingly homogenous families. Um, I conducted an experiment where I gave respondents a series of dating profiles of hypothetical individuals. And in these profiles, attributes like political views and religion, they were randomized. So it allows me to say which of these factors matter in shaping people's decisions. They were asked people their willingness to respond to messages, to message, to date, or to form friendships with the people featured in these profiles. So did politics matter? Um, turns out it does, and it matters at the same level as matching on religion or matching on education, which is striking. But there is some good news here. Getting an opposing party supporter on a profile, on average, didn't matter. People gravitated towards people that shared their partisanship. They weren't necessarily repelled by those that were opposed to them. And further analysis showed it's really only a small segment of people that are intensely hostile to opposing parties where it did matter. So that's generally good news. Polarization may be shaping people's willingness to form social relationships with political opponents, but it's not nearly as extreme here as it is in the United States. There are also cognitive consequences of polarization. First and foremost, what's known as selective exposure. You've probably heard this before. People tend to choose information uh, or sources of information like the news that support one's own politics and their worldviews. And even worse, people might cocoon themselves in echo chambers that shield them from uncomfortable information. As the importance of those identities increase with polarization, so too does the importance of selective exposure. I can shed light on this with an experiment in the Digital Democracy Project. In this case, I provided people with four pairs of hypothetical news story profiles. They were asked to pick a story that they would like to read. And in these profiles, I randomized the source so that some received a major national news outlet like the CBC or CTV, some got a local news source, and others got partisan news, either left-wing or right-wing in nature, like, say, rebel media. I also randomized the source of the headlines. Some were right-leaning headlines, some were left-leaning headlines. This graph here on the screen will show us the share of people selecting a story at different levels of partisanship along the x-axis. If people select headlines aligned with their partisanship, we should see a downward sloping line in red for left-leaning headlines and an upward sloping line in blue for right-leaning headlines. And that's what we see. So among strong supporters of the Liberals or NDP, 57% of respondents are expected to select the left-leaning headline, compared to 46% of respondents for conservative, strong conservative partisans. But it's worth noting, though, that these effects are quite modest in size. And there's even better news from this experiment. There's no selective engagement with partisan sources of news whatsoever. This graph here will plot the share of people selecting national news, a national news story starting on the left, then local news, and left or right slanted news. Liberal and NDP partisans will be in red, and conservatives will be in blue. And higher values mean people are more likely to select that source. And what we see is that stories from ma major national news outlets are more likely to be selected than partisan news sites by both groups of strong partisans. And in fact, people hardly make a distinction between sources of news slanted in their favor or against. And so that is, for instance, conservatives are just as unlikely to select a right-wing source compared to a left-wing source, compared to major national news. So this is a bit of a paradox. 
well, why don't our respondents show some love for partisan news? We see this going on in the U.S. Why is that not the case here? That's likely a mix of two factors. First, there's less awareness of these sources. People don't know necessarily what rebel news is, for instance. And there's lower levels of trust in partisan news relative to mainstream news. There's evidence of both of these things in the survey data. But the big kind of consequence of this, and I really want to draw your attention to, is that as a result, the size of partisan media audiences in Canada is extremely small. In 2019, we tracked the online search behavior of a sample of Canadians over the course of two weeks during the election. And in that sample of about 750 people, only seven people visited Rebel News at any point over two weeks. Two people visited the Post Millennial. No one visited Rebel.ca, compared to 33% who visited CBC Radio Canada. The overwhelming majority of Canadians consume no partisan news at all. And this result holds even when we include American sources like Fox News. So in short, people do support, prefer political information that backs their political views. This should not surprise us. But the effects are small. And so far, Canada's media environment really hasn't caught up to this demand. And we might worry about echo chambers existing, but they functionally do not exist at any level in Canada, despite growing polarization. And finally, without a doubt, the biggest concern raised about polarization is its toxicity for democracy itself. If citizens increasingly disagree with and dislike their political opponents, the stakes of political conf conflict skyrocket. Politics becomes more than just about debates over inane tax policy, for instance, but about institutions and rules and norms. And people might be less willing to concede political defeat in that sort of context. We see this dynamic spiraling towards political violence in the United States. But luckily, there's no evidence so far that this is a problem in Canada. I personally haven't done work in this area yet, so I want to give a shout out to the Environics Institute for monitoring these issues in Canada and the US. This graph on the screen shows the percentage of Canadians in that left panel that are satisfied with democracy across different levels of ideology. And unlike in the US, we see no growing gulf in democratic satisfaction that varies across election results. This next graph shows the same for the percentage of people who have a lot of trust in elections. And again, unlike the US, there are minimal differences between the left and the right. They're broadly satisfied with democracy and trust the, in, in what our elections produce. In short, Canadians aren't necessarily willing to socially wall themselves off from their political opponents, even amidst polarization. While we might prefer politically aligned news content that backs up our politics, they haven't meaningfully turned away from mainstream news, and there remains cross-partisan consensus on matters relating to democracy. This is all pretty good news. We're polarizing, but maybe the consequences that a lot of people fear just aren't there. But that's not to say this will always be true. Um, the U.S. spiraled towards increasingly destructive polarization in a remarkably short span of time. So is there anything that we can do about it? Unfortunately, I'm more of an identifying problems than identifying solutions kind of academic at this stage in my career. Um, and I worry that there's no magic wand that can be waved to depolarize uh, Canadians. And I think that's true because the responsibility mostly rests with our political parties. Partisan and affective polarization are likely consequences of our major parties becoming more ideological over time. We see that the liberals have moved to the left and the conservatives to the right. And this has left the center vacant as measured by the content of party platforms by scholars. So ideologically charged rhetoric and policy don't go unnoticed by Canadians. It has consequences. It polarizes them. And it's also possible that social media is further sharpening political conflict, though it isn't a cause of polarization per se. It can do this by making easier for people to hear perspectives that reinforce their own beliefs. But probably even more importantly, it exposes people to very inflammatory content from the other side. So we do need greater transparency 
in recommendation algorithms across social media platforms, more access for scholars to study these things, uh, and changes are needed to reduce the virality of provocative content, which travels at light speed through social media. And most of this isn't driven by bots, even though we like to point them out as the boogeyman. Social media isn't just problematic because of its circulation of misinformation. It has polarization consequences as well, even when factual information is disseminated. Ultimately, though, I'm, I'm pretty skeptical of the prospects of depolarization. Um, it's a tall order. Uh, I do think it might be more practical to focus on reducing challenges associated with polarization. For one, as I talked about earlier, people do think we're more polarized than we really are. The news media is almost certainly the principal source of these misperceptions. Journalists and editors have commercial incentive to hype up political conflict. So we really do need more reflection by journalists on how they can responsibly cover politics. Uh, and we need to think carefully about how, how we talk about polarization, um, because just by talking about it, we might increase perceptions that it's a problem. We also do a really poor job at preparing children, citizens, uh, to be responsible participants of democracy. Um, this could mean building media literacy skills um, to build up resilience to misinformation in online spaces, uh, to bolster trust in mainstream news by educating people about what exactly journalists do. We could teach children how to engage in healthy and constructive political dialogue. We do have some work in political science, for instance, that shows that, cr that respectful cross-partisan dialogue does depolarize. So normalizing those sorts of interactions, I think, is extremely important. Um, we can also make people aware of their own political blind spots, their tendency to prefer information that backs their own beliefs, um, to engage in motivated reasoning, that is the selective acceptance or rejection of information based on its convenience for one's politics. Making people aware of these cognitive biases is also uh, very important. And finally, we need to adapt communication strategies for a polarized era. Uh, I think across a lot of different domains, it's really important to build areas of cross-partisan consensus. I think of climate change, for instance. And this means we need to identify those who are resistant to persuasion on a certain issue and find ways to bridge that divide. And this can be as simple. We don't have to overthink it. It can be as simple as building relationships with trusted messengers in targeted communities. Um, we can make arguments in ways that are compatible with people's values. In other words, we need to meet people where they are uh, and respectively engage with their beliefs and try to persuade them from that perspective. Polarization also isn't necessarily a bad thing, and I want to leave us off with this thought. Politics should be a contest of ideas and values um, where reasonable people can disagree. But we can manage the potential bad consequences of that polarization. We can do that better uh, to make the process healthier and more constructive. So thank you very much, uh, and I look forward to the discussion. Wow, Eric. Um, I don't think I was expecting some of that, honestly. There is a lot to think about there. Um, you know, the, the last couple of years, the conversations that we've all had, again, at our dinner table with our friends, uh, doesn't really jive with what you just said. So I want to dive into that a little bit more. Uh, but first, before we get into the discussion, I want to remind our participants that you can ask questions. So use the chat function, submit your questions, and I will be able to ask them to our speakers, one of whom I'd like to introduce now is uh, Scott Matthews. So Scott Matthews, also joining us on our panel today, is the Associate Professor in the Department of Political Science at Memorial University of Newfoundland. Scott brings a wealth of knowledge in the study of elections, voting, and public opinion in Canada and the United States. States and looks at things like uh, the psychology of political learning, the role of uncertainty in support for costly public investments and how that affects us. So really, really interesting stuff to dive into there as well. Welcome, Scott. Thanks, Aisha. Um, so maybe I'll go to you first, because I know I have a ton of questions and I have a, a lot of things that I want to dig into into Eric's findings. But with, you know, with what you just saw, can you give us your thoughts on Eric's findings, how it relates to some of the research that you're doing and any other points that you think 
you know, to start us off with, policymakers or just regular Canadian citizens should actually consider? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'll, I'll resist the urge to just praise everything and agree with everything that uh, Eric said, but that's actually a really hard thing for me not to do because it's, it's basically true. Um, but the one little bit of praise is just, you know, uh, a couple of years ago, just before the pandemic, it was my last trip. Uh, I was invited out to BC uh, to give a talk on polarization. And, and in constructing that talk, I really had to rely almost entirely on uh, evidence from the U.S. And, you know, uh, the kinds of dimensions Eric's talking about, I tried to speak to a lot of those, but there really was no Canadian uh, evidence. And, and now we have it. So that my main reaction to what Eric um, has done and is in the process of doing is that it's, this is just really critical for understanding Canada, um, especially because there are some real big differences here. Um, other sort of reactions, I wanted to kind of build on Eric's last comment about polarization not being such a bad thing. I, I, I guess it's sort of an academic tick to want to disagree with everything you hear or want to disagree with every bit of conventional wisdom. But, you know, not long ago, the conventional wisdom in Canada and the U.S. about parties was that they were too similar. And I guess when I'm saying not long ago, I'm thinking of the 1980s. Um, I mean, in the U.S., uh, uh, maybe a bit before the 80s in the case of the U.S., but the Democrats and Republicans were sometimes criticized as being just Tweedledum and Tweedledee, uh, you know, essentially interchangeable, and Americans didn't have a real choice. In fact, there was a, a really famous report among political scientists that was written uh, about the lack of a kind of responsible and ideological party system uh, in the 50s, I think, um, because the parties were too similar. They weren't polarized enough. We had the same kind of arguments uh, in Canada um, and, and much more recent, as, as late as the 1980s, um, Janine Brody and Jane Jensen and a couple of influential scholars of Canadian politics um, went as far as to suggest that there was a sort of bourgeois conspiracy uh, joining the liberals and conservatives uh, in, in essentially you know, closing debate on all kinds of economic issues uh, in order to preserve capitalism. I mean, we don't need to go that far to see that the parties actually were quite a lot more similar not that long ago, and not everyone liked that. Um, so it's just to reinforce the idea that you know, polarization as difference is not an inherently bad thing, and we might complain about a, a lack uh, of difference. But the last thing I just wanted to mention, just to start us off, that I think is really important in what Eric said, is um, that this kind of process of polarization in Canada is a long-term phenomenon, um, and in a way, in a way, kind of mo even more long-term than in the U.S. It was really in the 1990s that the party system, you know, blew up. That's kind of the metaphor we all use, with the Conservative Party essentially collapsing and giving birth to these two alternatives: the Reform Party, later the Alliance, and the Bloc Québécois. Um, by and large, Canadians were pleased by that development. Suddenly, they found parties that were closer to them uh, in ideological terms. That's reflected in Eric's data, where you see not just people finding their least like party more disagreeable, the party they like better. The party they like best, they like that party better than they used to because, you know, maybe you're a conservative and suddenly you have a truly conservative party uh, like the Reform Party. Um, the flip side of that is that difference between the parties also drove people to participate in politics. I've done some work on that in the past on voter turnout that shows that, among other things, I mean, there's a few pieces to the story, but one of the things is that people became less indifferent about the alternatives. When you have two kind of real different parties competing, uh, it kind of makes it more worth your time to get out and participate, to learn, to vote. Um, that's one of the upshots of polarization. So um, those are maybe some of my starting comments, but generally, I mean, I, I think what Eric's uh, presenting is really important and, and important lessons for all of us. Yeah, I think it definitely surprises a lot of people out there. I'm going to make that assumption. You know, we have over 1,500 participants uh, registered today for this event. And I'm sure people are going through their Twitter feed right now or their Instagram and they're like, look, here's clear polarization. It's it's true. Like I've lost friends over this in the past couple of years. So Eric, to go into a bit of your methodology, how do we know that when people are responding to the surveys or when, when you're, you know, whether you're asking questions or monitoring their behavior, how do we know they're actually telling the truth? And are there reasons why, you know, there may be 
some kind of hidden agenda in the responses that you're getting? Or maybe walk us through a little bit of your methodology. Yeah, so uh, this is just basic survey methodology. So using the Canadian election study. So that's that's a study that's run uh, every every Canadian election. Um, so there's a there's a, a, a campaign period survey, um, a, a post-election survey, and a mailback survey through most of these. Those there's been some methodological changes recently, moving towards online survey sampling. Um, typically, the, the concern that most academics have is on uh, questions that are, are that have social desirability issues. That is, um, that there is a norm in society that you're supposed to believe X, um, and it makes people more likely to say that they believe X uh, or that they behaved in a certain way. So the cl- classic example of this is when we ask people whether they turned out to vote, uh, a lot more people say they voted than actually voted uh, in surveys. And so that, that's an example of the, of the social desirability issue. Um, in the COVID context, there is there's some literature that shows that that people are more likely to say that they engaged in precautionary behaviors. So that's another example of social desirability. Here I'm just asking people to place their ideology um, on on a zero to ten scale, or in in my other work, uh, just their basic attitudes. Nothing particularly inflammatory. Just uh, kind of basic questions about the role of government. Um, in, in social life and economic life. And we typically don't see issues with social desirability on those sorts of questions. Um, so certainly there's, uh, you know, there's always issues with, uh, with survey respondents not paying particularly careful attention to, to, their, sur- to their responses. Um, not everybody is fully motivated when they're responding to a survey. Uh, but on average, those responses tend to wash out uh, with, with effective and proper survey design. Um, and that's why, you know, relying on an academic study uh, done by, you know, the, the best the discipline uh, when crafting these sorts of questions, I think, is really important. Um, so I, I don't suspect those issues arise with anything that I've shown today. Yeah, you mentioned ideology, and I think that was one of the things that really, not necessarily shocked me, but struck me, was uh, when you mentioned that the ideological differences between the liberals and the conservatives have increased over 100% since 1997, right? And conservatives, NDP, I think you said, were already kind of on the opposite ends of the spectrum, but over 100%. And yeah, if it's the ideology that's actually causing that polarization, maybe can you delve into that a little bit more? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so, so, the, so the argument that I make in my work is that uh, people increasingly disagreeing with one another on, on basic questions related to the role of government uh, is, is, a, is a driver of, of who they like and dislike. Uh, so it, it generates that sort of affective response. Um, and and th- that's a conservative estimate, that, that 100%. It depends on the indicator that I use. So in, in my work, I have that self-placement scale that I show that's the most conservative estimate. Uh, but I also use people's policy attitudes. I separate those policy attitudes to economic views and social views. So attitudes towards, say, same-sex marriage and abortion, those sorts of questions. And, and there's even more action on social questions. So, so for, on social questions, the different the, the uh, similarity between liberals and conservatives has increased 270 percent um, over the time of, of, the, sur- of the, the Canadian election study. Um, so, so these are big numbers. Um, and, and 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 as it, and, and there's also increasing disagreement between the NDP and conservatives as well on those sorts of questions too. Um, so th- these are big differences, and 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 they are likely drivers of increasingly of, of the tendency to increasingly dislike your your political opponents. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean Canadians are becoming more extreme. Um, and that's that's the and there's all and the other caveats that I talked about. Um, disagreeing with one another on the role of government is not necessarily a bad thing on its own, um, and you can manage the consequences for affective polarization in a number of ways. So, so, so nothing that I showed is is necessarily bad in, in, in an important sense. And I agree with everything that Scott said about how there are normative benefits to polarization. Um, our institutions, unlike the United States, I I would argue are are better structured to manage polarization when it occurs for a variety of reasons. Um, and so so nothing I've shown, I think, concerns me in, 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 a, in a serious way. And I think that's a really important distinction when you're talking about, you know, polarization, not, not always a bad thing, but it's the extreme, like becoming more extreme in our beliefs. Right. And that's kind of where I think generally when we're we're just talking at the dinner table, we mix those two things up or we use right. them interchangeably. So our right. beliefs are not becoming more extreme. 
Mm-hmm. And what's really important for public servants, and this is why I love the research and the data, and you're, you know, we need data to be able to make good policies and to, to present options to government for the different things that are happening. But when we're basing those policies and those recommendations and options on assumptions that we are more extreme in our beliefs and that there is this huge political polarization, we might not be doing, uh, we might, we not might not be putting the right policies and recommendations forward. So this data is really humbling for, I think, all of us to sit back and say, okay, we've we've had these assumptions for a few years based on everything that's out there, but now there's actually been research and data done. So maybe one more question before I go to Scott and, and for you, Eric, and Scott, feel free to comment on it as well if you like. But as federal public servants, as policymakers, so if Canada is not becoming, Canadians are not becoming more extreme in their beliefs, there is political polarization. What can we learn from other countries where it is increasing, where there is that increase in um, beliefs, you know, the, the, the extreme in beliefs, and where the polarization is intensifying? And maybe not so much the U.S., because I do want to get into the U.S. in a moment, but are there other countries that we can kind of learn from in terms of policy making, yeah, um, I, you know, I think I think the lesson here is mostly for politicians. Politicians and political parties have the ability to construct coalitions uh, of people that are going to support them on election day. They do that by taking policy stances to appeal to certain groups of citizens. They take rhetorical stances, even if it's not necessarily reflected in policy, that appeal to certain groups of citizens. They have choices about about who they court and who they don't. Um, and, uh, you know, in Canada over time, there's, there's increasingly been this, this tendency towards the minimum winning coalition. You, you get your base out and a little bit more just to get, to get the majority government. Um, and, and so, so that is kind of the starting point. I think where the countries where you see it being the most toxic are where, uh, where politicians are crafting concerns around racial, religious identity, um, that it, it, it inhibits their ability to be able to reach out to broader groups in society. Uh, and so in the United States, you have the Republicans and Democrats, um, because of the rhetorical signals sent, especially by the Republican Party, that they, they are polarizing on these social dimensions, race, income, religion, uh, in, in, that in ways that it's, it's not just about policy, it's, more, it's much more fundamental than that. Um, and it raises the stakes of political conflict. It makes it much more toxic. Um, and that all flows down to political elites and the choices that they made. The Republican Party had the choice to court racial conservatives under the, in the Nixon administration. Um, under Reagan, they had the choice to court social conservatives. Uh, and now under Trump, um, ethnic nationalists uh, and white supremacists uh, to the extreme. And so they have the choice of, of, of who to court. And so, and so that is, is the lesson there. So that's, and that's where we really should be concerned is if, if political parties start making those choices um, in, in that sort of fashion. And I don't think that's where we are here. And, and so avoiding that in the future, I think is critical. All right. So kind of on the same vein, Scott, and, you know, feel free to comment on that one, but even taking it one step further. So from everything that we've been listening to so far, um, you know, situations very different in Canada than maybe in other parts of the world. Definitely not like it is in the United States or some of the Latin American countries. So we found to be, it seems like we're more um, a policy difference than the polarity. You know, Canadians are really thinking more about how much should government be involved in our day-to-day lives and our social lives than, than other things. So considering that, then what kind of strategies can policymakers adopt so that we can actually engage Canadians and stakeholders in policy decisions where there are those strong differences in how much government should be involved. And then kind of move away from that assumption that we have these extreme beliefs, but really focus on, you know, what Canadians are really thinking. So how can we engage uh, Canadians more? And and maybe Scott, after you, we'll go straight to Eric for comments on that too. Well, I mean, I have a few sort of thoughts uh, around this. I mean, one is that... Um, and then this this really, I think, complements what Eric uh, presented. Facts still matter. Um, there's this uh, increasingly current idea, and it's part of the false polarization narrative that uh, I think the media and, and, and academics, to some degree, are responsible for 
you know, disseminating. Uh, but there's this idea that uh, basically, you know, people choose their own facts now. Um, they're so absorbed by, so intoxicated with, that's the metaphor that has uh, been used by um colleagues of uh, Eric's and mine in political science, they're so intoxicated by partisanship that they're totally impervious to information. Um, and that, you know, one set of arguments uh, has to be prepared for one group and a different set for another group. Um, it's certainly the case that partisanship and other social identities and strong attitudes of all kinds can interfere with people's ability to make kind of rational sense of the information they're exposed to. Um, but that's not all that's going on. People do, there, there's plenty of information, uh, plenty of evidence, I should say, that people uh, respond to information, um, particularly uh, on the, the kinds of matters uh, that are not so uh, easily absorbed uh, into partisan debate, um, things that are kind of ambiguous, where there's uh, you know diversity of moral standards, where understanding is low. Those are things where partisanship really, uh, you know, bites the most. It makes the biggest difference. Um, some of my own work uh, has been about how information about the economy um, can be a, a kind of source of convergence in political attitudes, at least when economic circumstances are relatively extreme. Uh, in, in work that I've done with uh, Mark Pickup out at Simon Fraser University on uh, Canadian elections, um, we find not entirely consistent, but uh, pretty uh, uh, strongly suggestive evidence anyway that um, when the economy is going particularly well or particularly badly, uh, an increase in reporting of that economic situation uh, in the media uh, tends to bring partisans together uh, around a kind of common view of economic circumstances. That, that's significant because most of the time, partisans disagree quite a lot about how the economy is going. It's one of the big things governments are expected to do. And so, out partisans, uh, you know, those who are partisans of the party not in government, have a strong motivation to see things as going uh, worse uh, than those in government and vice versa. Um, around, uh, you know, in circumstances when economic conditions are sort of more clear, uh, less ambiguous, it seems that more information uh, can, can bring partisan groups together. And just to bring in the U.S. example, there's a, a, a similar study prior to ours with a lot more data that shows this over a really long period of time in, in American attitudes. So, you know, the economy is perennially important to political choice, to decision-making in elections, and it seems to be one area where more information uh, really does uh, make a difference. And there's there's lots of findings like that, really. Um, so I, I suppose this is a kind of pedantic point, but it, I, it's an important one. It's not all or nothing. It's not all partisanship and, and kind of polarized, people polarized into divergent social camps um, or you know, total rationality, the truth is actually in, in the middle. And, uh, and, and I think that, so for government, for, for civil servants, um, information still matters. And so continuing to do the kinds of things that civil servants do, supporting uh, the political executive, but also uh, through the, uh, at the departmental level and, and in the more service capacity, I still think, you know, high quality research expertise, the things that public service has uh, still count. Yeah, just, just to build on that point, Scott, um, I totally agree. And, and there's a lot of, even in the U.S. context, there's evidence that things like fact-checking, uh, they're still effective. That you, If you try to correct a Republican on the facts, they'll move their attitudes towards factual information. And even in the context of like a really high pol toxic polarization, uh, facts still matter. Uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic, the vast majority of Canadians trust experts, the vast majority of conservatives trust experts, the vast majority of conservatives vaccinated, double vaccinated, um, have high opinions of experts, are persuaded by experts. Um, and so and we, we tend to lose sight of those things. So, the, so there are facts still matter, expertise still matters. Um, conservatives are not uh, opposed to any of that to a, to a strong degree in Canada. Um, we, we tend to exaggerate those differences because in part because of what we see going on in the United States. Um, there's also, it's just, you know, we have to, we are all probably very politically engaged. 
there's a lot of people out there that they don't live for the cut and thrust of politics. There's a lot of people that are, um, you know, not on Twitter all the time, um, exposed to all this content. And so there's a whole other world out there that we, we probably, that probably doesn't reflect our own social circles. These people aren't that polarized. They might not strongly identify with the party. And so that's a lot of Canadians right there that you also have to bring on board for policy and, and the like. And, uh, and, and just, just, just kind of starting off with an assumption that everyone's polarized. No one can, no one can be convinced. It just, it's not, it's not reflective of the reality on, on a month, on a number of different levels. Um, but that being said, um, you know, we, there is more disagreement out there in, in Canadian politics than there used to be. Uh, and so if you, if you can find ways of meeting people where they are, you know, you know, trying to persuade them that there, there is a difference between facts and values. Uh, some questions have normative foundations where people are going to disagree. And, uh, and in those cases, yeah, just saying, well, the experts say this is probably not going to work the way you think it is. So, so, so some sensitivity is called for uh, when normative value-based questions are at play. Um, and then having respectful dialogue and all that, um, you know, I think that's important for political parties, for civil servants, for educators across the board. Um, it's something we need to do better at. Okay, so let's maybe take that angle then. If we're talking about political leadership, and um, you know they they do play a crucial role in in de-escalating some of the divides, are there examples? And I'll pose this to both of you: Are there examples maybe in other regions or other jurisdictions of initiatives that have actually been effective in fostering cross-partisan collaboration? Because if, from what I'm hearing, if a lot of this and a lot of what we believe or a lot of what we see in the assumptions that we're making are based on, you know, the the political parties and the divide between them, then what what examples are out there to close that divide a little bit? Is this for Scott or me? Either one of you. You both look like you have something to say. So maybe we'll go to Scott first. <laughs> so, well, I mean, uh, so I... I in thinking about this question, I I admit that I, um, you know, I am what I am. I'm a, a psychologically oriented political scientist, uh, and and I think about mass politics and how, not so much about political leaders. I'm concerned about how citizens respond to what political leaders are putting out there. And so my, um, you know, what I have to say about something like that is really about. Um, you know, how citizens might respond to different approaches. Um, one of the most encouraging findings um, in the last number of years that I've seen is from a study that looked at how, how, how what difference it makes um, if people are told that there is some overlap uh, between uh, political leaders on in different parties or on different sides of an issue. Um, there's, there's one study in particular... Uh, and Eric will know the one I'm talking about as I start to describe it, that uh, compares essentially how susceptible are people are to persuasive arguments uh, on a political issue uh, under three different conditions. Um, when those arguments are not attributed to any partisan sources, when those arguments are attributed to partisan sources, uh, and when those arguments are attributed to partisan, those same partisan sources, but people are told that you know, for example, most Republicans are on this side of the issue, but there are a few on the other side. Um, the amazing thing about this research, and they replicated it uh, with a few different issues, um, is that people were as susceptible to the arguments in the kind of in-between condition, there's a few people on the other side, as they were when there was no partisan information uh, at all presented. Um, and, and this is a kind of, that's a kind of practical uh, kind of lesson, but it, it, it links into a larger idea psychologically, which is that, you know, one of the things that challenges people to change their minds and to see the perspective of the other side um, is that essentially politics is presented in an all or nothing, black or white, absolutist kind of way, as opposed to a space where reasonable people disagree. Um, there's room for discussion. There's room for disagreement. You're not a bad person. Um, you know, some of some, some people on my side uh, actually happen to agree with the folks on the other side. These kinds of interventions, I think, are, are significant because, you know, people want to among other things, they want to feel that they're 
their their attitudes are justified, that they make sense, that they're compatible with compatible with the belief that they're a good person. Um, and when you create an environment that makes politics very uh, binary, and when political claims are advanced in a highly categorical way, um, I think it's quite toxic for uh, for people's ability to be open and say, you know, maybe I'm wrong about that, or I don't agree with you, but uh, I don't dislike you. Uh, I don't think you're an evil person. Um, and so I think that's a lesson for political leaders and for all Canadians, um, that the quality of the way we talk about political conflict I mean, it's it, it's not just something that sounds nice. It's something that is demonstrably important to the psychology of the way people um, can be persuaded and can come together in politics and society on a, on a whole host of issues. Yeah, there. Yeah, and uh, you know, and we have there are certain attributes of the Canadian the Canadian institutions that that heighten these sorts of polarization dynamics that, that elites engage in, and so you have. You have winner-take-all single-member plurality elections, um, where it's uh, where, where the stakes of conflict increase, and so so some scholars would say, well, you know, some forms of proportional representation might be able to mute some of this, some of these dynamics. That it's not it's not all or nothing. That you you know you have to be responsible coalition partners with other parties, uh, and so it, it, it tones down the rhetoric and, and, and tones down the temperature. So you could you could imagine some, not all forms of PR, but some forms of PR might might help with that. Obviously, you would want some uh, guardrails to prevent really extreme parties from coming in. But uh, that that being aside, um, and then we have you know op, you know a question period. The whole the whole notion of the parliamentary structure is oppositional, uh, and so it, it kind of breeds that sort of that sort of conflict. Um, uh, you know, putting the cameras on in, in parliamentary committees and uh, you know, allows for grandstanding. So there's all, all these things that, that have kind of really kind of supercharged things uh, in, in Ottawa and, and provincial legislatures. I'm not sure like what can be done to, to soften those sorts of um, those sorts of tendencies, um, in, institutional reform that encourages collaboration. I don't know what that looks like, really. Um, but there are, are kind of inherent features of the Canadian political system that that, uh, that definitely sharpen things. Yeah, that's just popped. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to sort of reinforce what uh, Eric said. Uh, I mean, these are inherent features and they have been actually getting a little bit worse um, over the last 20 years or so or aggravated um, by the frequency of elections. Um, you know, the, the idea that uh, the idea of the permanent campaign that we're always in, the parties are always in election mode you know, for obvious reasons, it does heighten the, the desire to grandstand or, uh, you know, it makes it harder to, to compromise to see the other side, it makes it more dangerous politically. Um, so some of this stuff, you know, in, in a time of minority governments, maybe maybe that's uh, part of the story. I, I'm not, not at all suggesting that's the whole story, but I think that's part of the story too. No, I think those are fascinating observations. And, and one of the questions we got in, I'm not getting to the, the audience questions right now, but another plug, if you do have questions, please put them in the chat and we will uh, ask our speakers soon. But one of the questions um, that you just answered was kind of like, why is there such a disconnect between politicians and the population? And I think what you both just mentioned about, you know, it's some of it's institutionalized, like question period. Yeah, absolutely. It's about... You know, it's a, it's it's very different than some of the other um, jurisdictions that we see. Uh, you know, always in election mode, the the minority government kind of well, oh, here we are, elect going into elections again. So, what are the the big and perhaps polarizing issues that we need to focus on, right? As um, as as Canadians or as the the elections go through. So, something that I don't think I've really thought about in in those terms. Um, so. When we are, um, you know, as public servants, I guess, ourselves, or, or maybe not just public servants, but there's a, a lot of immigration still happening in Canada. Um, we have new Canadians who come in. I don't know what their views might be about the state of polarization in Canada before they get here. But what should we actually consider when we're educating the new generation of Canadians, whether immigrants or our kids who are who are being raised in Canada and um, on this topic? So, like, what should we be focusing on when it comes to polarization so that we kind of maybe 
we hope that they don't have the same assumptions we do. And then maybe, I don't know, dig a little deeper into what's actually going on. Um, I think the biggest thing, this is, this is more, probably more for children than for, uh, than for new immigrants. But, uh, you know, I remember my civics class back in grade 10 and uh, half credit course teacher put up, put up his shoes on the table, gave us a reading. And, and, that, and that was it. That was, that was a civics class, basically. Uh, we need to do a lot better, a better job at that. And, and I think there is a, there's a tendency to, well, okay, if you want to avoid polarization, then you need to just avoid conflict. Um, but that's not really help, healthy or helpful. People just suppress what they think. They're resentful for it. Um, people have to, we have to allow for and educate citizens into having respectful conversations that, that highlight disagreement and, and, and allow for some form of accommodation in that regard. Um, so, the, you know, we have research that suggests that cross-partisan dialogue uh, can reduce affective polarization, make people like the other side a little bit more. Uh, part of the reason for that is it probably reduces that that false polarization I talked about. That we tend to exaggerate beliefs about the other side. There's still more work being done on this, so there's all sorts of caveats based on the design, the research design, the topics that are discussed, and all that. But there's definitely some potential there of like of of of, um, of educating citizens, children about about how to have those conversations with one another uh, at an early stage. I think uh, can be can be very helpful. Um, and, and and also just recognizing their own cognitive biases that we're not uh, everybody thinks the other side's biased when when we all are because of our own values uh, and so instilling these sorts of notions early on I think is really important uh, it doesn't start with children like we, we all could use a, a helpful refresher on some of those issues too um, but I think you know the earlier the better but how do you do that in the age of social media where, you know, and I've said this before, um, as much as, you know, I like to think that I'm very well read and I read a whole news article and I read a variety of different sources, the reality is I get a lot of information pushed to me and we know how the algorithms work and everything else. So you're busy day to day life. You're having these conversations about you know, first thing in the morning, I turn on my Google and I say, hey, Google, tell me the news. And it's like three minutes of headlines across the world. And that's what I'm going to take with me for the rest of my day. So the points you're making, Eric, are, are great. We need to start having those conversations. I like the, you know, cross-partisan dialogue, etc. But the reality is it's hard for me to, and part of my job is actually going out and finding the news and what's happening in the world. It's hard for me to do that. So how does the average Canadian start to think about things differently? Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. I well. I'll uh, I'll jump in just to say that. Uh, yeah. I think it's a it's a tricky tricky problem to think about how we change our media system. Um, not least because we have a a free a kind of commercial open society sort of media system, uh, and not not a whole lot of this is in the hands of government or which is to say it's not in our hands collectively to do much about it as Canadians. Um, so I, I, I kind of like the direction of Eric's suggestions about civic education. I mean, I, all I would add is I think, you know, the the idea that civic education is the solution to our democratic ills doesn't have a, a great reputation in political science, but I think that's because we usually think of it as, uh, you know, uh, potentially a place where people can kind of learn about policy issues and learn how to make good vote choices. It's never going to happen. Um, but civic education as a place to inculcate um, values, but 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 kind of values of civil discourse, um, values of democracy like openness to the other side, um, the importance of making arguments uh, in, 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 in ways that, well, that others can at least in principle accept, um, respecting others. I, I mean, so those kinds of kind of process values for democratic politics I'm not saying there's nothing else civic education should do, but that sounds to me like a really important one, a kind of uh, way to go. And then, you know, I think that would be complementary with media literacy. I mean, I, I know that there are multiple NGOs, uh, one in particular totally escapes my name, that's working on this in particular, um, that, you know, going into schools and, and, and teaching young people uh, how to evaluate the credibility of 
the information they encounter, um, lateral reading and so on, these kinds of strategies. I think that should be part of a civic education curriculum, you know, probably less institutional detail, more, you know, basic democratic principles and strategies that can be applied no matter what comes um, in the future. And uh, yeah, so I think, I think that that's one thing I'd say. I, I, that's, that's not so much for new, like Eric, I guess that's for young people, not so much for for immigrants. I mean, my own my own view is that a lot of people immigrating to Canada are coming from places that are demonstrably vastly more polarized than Canada, mm-hmm. um, and uh, so I think they. I think we should respect their, uh, that they may have some things to teach us uh, mm-hmm. about what is going right here, uh, and and also uh, perhaps things that should be changed, but. Anyway, that's just a slightly flip remark, but I, when I think of the kinds of students I encounter, uh, most of the immigrants I encounter nowadays are, are students, uh, people studying here. Uh, I'm, I'm kind of struck by just how good we have it. I, I know it's uh, kind of trite, but um, that's but I think one of that's my reactions. Actually, a really, really um, thought-provoking reaction, though, Scott, because, you know, typically, like, as policymakers or as public servants, when we're going out and we're doing our stakeholder engagement, we're often thinking about, okay, who are the groups that we need to for us, uh, to talk to for a certain topic? And I don't know, first of all, full, full disclosure, I don't know that we've actually gone out and done anything with regards to polarization, but immediately thinking of, you know, the immigrant population or recent immigrants to Canada and what their views are on, you know, Canadian politics and polar, political polarization wouldn't have come to my mind. But how fascinating would their views be given that they have experiences in other countries that are vastly, potentially vastly different than ours? So certainly something for all of us to think about as public servants on, you know, the earlier question of how, who do we engage and how do we engage the public when it comes to this? It's not just people who necessarily um, do have political party alliances and feel strongly about how government should be uh, in how much they should be involved in our lives. It's people who have experiences elsewhere that can also help us. Eric, did you want to jump in there? I might've cut you off. Uh, yeah, just like I had one one quick point just to build on Scott's point about media literacy. Um, typically, those sorts of interventions are used mostly to combat misinformation. But but in a broader sense, media literacy skills could also... So, so, there's, so there's one stream of, of research that that suggests that you know, inculcation strategies work at combating misinformation. What those are is it's basically educating people about uh, the strategies that people that that's, that disseminate fake news, like what what to watch out for. These are the strategies they use. This is kind of what we should look for. Um, and then and then it kind of inculcates them. So they they may see a piece of fake news and there's like, oh, I I know how to spot that. Um, and so you you can imagine an an, an analog for uh, for social media, where you know we're you know young you know children are going to be on social media and and they're going to be bombarded with very inflammatory content, the stuff that goes viral, the stuff that that heightens that political conflict and um, and so so kind of being clear early on that this is a very distorted picture of reality. Journalists can use this lesson too uh, when they write stories based on a handful of tweets that they happen to come across. Um, but but I think uh, you know it, getting it, getting to children early with this I think is important and, and I think you know well, research has shown that um, younger people do have higher levels of media literacy uh, and so they might be able to more more effectively wade through social media space without necessarily being overtly influenced by the inflammatory content that they see so I, so I'm hopeful for the future and I, I think things are moving in the right direction but certainly. Uh, more can be done on that. It's not just about misinformation and fake news. It's also about just all of the toxicity that's out there. It is not reflective of, of the vast majority of the public. So that's an interesting point. And I, I won't go too deep into it because I know we want to get to questions from the audience, but you just mentioned, you know, uh, younger people might be able to navigate social media better. I think another one of our assumptions is that they're the ones who get sucked into all of the the negativity and the fake news that's out there. So again, to all of my public servants, there's over 1,500 watching us right now. Um, we've got 
a new generation of public servants coming in. And I think using that expertise that these new public servants have on just navigating social media and where to go for news sources and spotting fake news. I mean, how fantastic would that be for us to be able to then know uh, what's actually happening out there as we're making our, our policy decisions and our recommendations. So another great point, Eric. Okay, so I could continue to ask questions all morning and um, or afternoon, depending on where you are. I am going to go to the audience because we do have a number of questions that have been coming in. So I've grouped a couple of them together. Uh, the first ones are around, again, your methodology, Eric. So people curious to delve in a little bit deeper. And the first question about your methodology is whether or not your study includes news information, uh, news or information that was shared on Facebook or other social media platforms? And if so, how that would actually influence people's views when they're responding? Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure which, which part of all of the blizzard of findings that I presented that refers to. Um, can, can you repeat the question? So does the study include news or information that's been shared on Facebook or other social media platforms and how that would influence people's views? Um, so, so some of the data I draw on is from the Digital Democracy Project, and, and part part of that project also did like a social media scrape of of, every, of Facebook, Twitter, a whole bunch of different platforms over the course of that election. And so, there there is if there's one little bit of a difference in, in the findings is that there does tend to be a little bit more echo chambery sort of behavior in terms of the in terms of what people pay attention to on Twitter. And so who they follow, uh, who they retweet, uh, all of that tends to be more homogenous um, than people's overall selection of the news. Um, and so, so that's, so I guess that's uh, where, where social media data is, is useful. Um, that, that is one caveat. Um, still not an overwhelming tendency. Uh, people are, and I think for, for reasons of virality and all that, they are exposed to voices on the other side on social media, not the voices that will be the most constructive, but they are nonetheless exposed to them. Um, but that is uh, one, one key difference, I think. And can you speak about the representativeness or you know, the diversity of participants of the data sets and responses? And have you noticed differences among those participants or those responses related to racial backgrounds or other kind of identifying factors? Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, the one, one of the key limitations of the Canadian election study. So it is it, it's a great survey. It is uh, it is representative um, of, of the Canadian population generally. But some of the questions that I have to rely on are from the mailback survey, um, just because of how researchers structured uh, the survey early on. Um, and so we're, we're getting we're, you know, once you get to a sample of you know, 800 respondents or so, um, if you want to pick up the share of visible minorities that are in that, you're, you're really slicing and dicing the sample pretty fine there. Um, and so unfortunately, with, with the data that currently exists and for the questions that I use, uh, it's not really possible to, to look at patterns um, in, in such fine-grained detail. It would, be, it would be very interesting to see. And that's true, especially going, you know, going back to 1993, the percentage of, of respondents that are uh, ethnic and racial minorities has gone up over time, um, but starting at the beginning of this series, it is, it is quite small. So it's not, it's not, unfortunately, it's not possible to slice and dice that fine um, to, to evaluate that. Um, the CES now, though, is moving towards big online samples. Um, and so there's a trade-off there uh, that I'm happy to speak to, but, um, but these sorts of concerns moving forward will be, will be less of a problem. Um, but unfortunately, then, if, you, if you're interested in a long, a long-term trend, you got to wait a whole bunch of election cycles to be able to, to, to do that. Mm -hmm. It was definitely interesting, though. I think you mentioned that um, we think conservatives are wealthier or they're, you know, right wing, etc. And we think that NDP supporters are are left wing and racialized, and maybe that's not the case. So it, it would be fascinating to kind of correlate the two or put them together. And um, yeah, and, and it, yeah, it is certainly true. These these tendencies are modest, but they they still exist. So we we do have uh, exaggerated perceptions on those dimensions. And and a, and a crucial point that I that I didn't uh, fully get into with the presentation is that those perceptions, 
um, are also an important correlate of how intensely people dislike the other side. And that's yeah. holding, that's accounting for policy differences, ideological differences, all those sorts of things. So those perceptions um, might matter in their own right at, at intensifying um, affective polarization. Interesting. Interesting. Um, so we do have a few questions in about the United States. So maybe we can pivot back to that. And Scott, I'll start with you. So, you know, what do you think about the state of polarization in the U.S. and how that actually affects the perception of political conflict in Canada, but particularly situations like the fundamental human rights changes down south, right? And kind of linked to that, because they're combined or they're the related questions, is how much of what we think is polarization here in Canada simply a cultural bleed off from the amount of US content we consume? Right. Like you grow up watching these U.S. shows. I lived down in the States for two years. I was like, whoa, culture shock, you know, but uh, how much of it is is from the content? Yeah, I mean, I so I think that's a a really sharp question slash observation. I mean, I think Canadians, especially English Canadians, are really immersed in American culture. And increasingly, that's American politics, too. Uh, I have been really struck over the last few years. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll use uh, you know <laughs> the typical thing that academics do or in my field, which is my mom uh, suddenly knows all of these prominent figures in American politics. She knows the Senate Majority Leader or Minority Leader, who she really dislikes, uh, and uh, she she got really invested in uh, his Senate race uh, in 2020. I mean, I, 10 years ago, I'm positive she wouldn't have known. And, and she's not totally uninterested politically, uh, and she's, uh, you know, a, a very intelligent person, but American politics just didn't interest her. But now uh, she's disturbingly obsessed with it. And I think a lot of Canadians uh, are like that. Um, I mean, it has been the, the, the conflict of American politics attracts interest for its entertainment value, if nothing else, but also for what it might be telling us about the future of our kind of most important trading partner, uh, you know, social partner. Um, uh, any case, I mean, there, there certainly uh, have been some efforts to try and document uh, these effects bleeding over, uh, particularly sort of through the Trump era. And uh, Eric may know a bit more about that than I do. One thing that um, I have uh, been trying to speak to in some of my recent work with uh, another fellow uh, at Toronto, Randy Besco, Eric Merkley's colleague, um, is about the racialization of Canadians' views of the political parties, you know, how racial attitudes are increasingly coming to inform uh, perceptions of the part, not perceptions, evaluations of the parties, presumably because of perceptions of the parties. Um, and this is something that has really intensified uh, over the past seven, eight years, um, this, this dynamic of, of the parties being evaluated in terms of racial attitudes. And I think that that story is impossible to tell without acknowledging that the era of the Trump presidency took the already quite racialized American political scene uh, and dialed it up uh, in a, a really remarkable way uh, with the kinds of explicit racialized rhetoric we saw in that era. Um, but I also think this has resulted in the reframing of all kinds of political conflicts. Um, and, and, you know, it's, goes beyond Trump, but the movement uh, that arose following the killing of George Floyd, a global movement uh, for racial justice, I really think uh, helped to advance new, and I personally would say important ways of thinking about how law and order issues are racialized. Um, I, I think for Americans, that wasn't news. Um, that's an issue that's been racialized for a long time, but I think it's being increasingly racialized in Canada and that concepts like systemic racism now on every politician's lips, uh, and many Canadians understand that term now as well, that's a new development. And that is really a reflection, I think, of the American political scene and our, our kind of proximity to it. Eric, any comments you want to make on that? Yeah, I, I certainly think that there, there, there is something there about U.S. influence in Canada. And, like, and it, to some degree, start, starts with journalists. Um, they, they love the narratives that, 
Canada equals U.S. on on, on anything. So anything that happens down there, it's like, well, what's what's the story here? Like, are we the same? And, and it's just it pervades everything. Like so many interviews that I get from journalists have some sort of framing like that. And and so those sorts of story frames kind of spill over and, and affect people's uh, views as well. Um, but uh, but and there are a lot of people, a lot of Canadians that that do consume American media. Um, and so I have some work that shows that that those that use social media and consume a U.S. news, uh, they're more likely to, to harbor um, yeah, misperceptions related to COVID-19. Um, so, there, so there is some some spillover there. Uh, we see that in, in actual observed social media data. So those that follow more U.S. accounts uh, are more likely to to share fake news on on social media spaces. Um, so there's so there's certainly some things there, but it's it's tricky to really identify a U.S. driven effect on, on a lot of these questions. And so, like, okay, uh, if people that watch watch and read a lot of American news, they're more polarized than people that aren't. Well, they also watch and read a lot of more domestic news, and so it's it's tricky to to get the kind of causal effect of of that me- American media influence on um, on anything. Uh, so it's. You know, it's Remains to be seen how big the effect is, where it applies. I, I think there's something there, but it's it's hard to know. But what, but one thing to to keep in mind though, um, so to the extent that we would ex- expect that in Quebec with a distinct media system that is less dependent on the U.S., while there maybe things aren't happening in Quebec, but actually everything that I've shown is it applies in Quebec too. And so we see that that distinction between the Liberals and the NDP on the one side, conservatives on the other. Same affective polarization, same partisan sorting, partisan polarization is happening in Quebec as well. Same magnitudes of change, though they start from a lower baseline. Um, so, so you know, these long trend trends towards polarization, I don't think it's coming from the United States. There might be something recently that's aggravating certain things, but but uh, a lot of the, the long term trends that I'm talking about, I, I don't think it comes from the U.S. That's really fascinating what you said about Quebec there, because, you know, we do have a couple of questions again about, well, OK, so are these just trends and like everything else? You know, Scott, you mentioned uh, systemic racism and Canadians finally understanding what that means and how it applies in, in the Canadian context. So the questions were about, you know, are we just five or 10 years behind the U.S. on this trend and it's just going to get there? Um, what I'm hearing is that it's hard to really it's tricky to really figure out why, if we do get there, if it's because of uh, U.S. media and, and media sources, but well, I, before I we think, get to... Yeah, I think, I think this is a, a really good point that you raised, like, are, are, we, are we 10 years behind? And I, but I think it's important to note that there, there is one, notwithstanding the media environment and political discourse and all that, there are very important institutional differences between Canada and the United States um, that make me kind of skeptical that that's the case. Um, in the U.S., you have institutions structured to basically benefit white rural Americans and protect their power uh, in the American political system. And so the Republican Party has been able to, to avoid discipline by public opinion, uh, by catering to those groups and, 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 and uh, exploiting the Electoral College, their advantage in the Senate, uh, gerrymandering, all that. We don't have these things in Canada. And so the Conservative Party is much more disciplined by electoral politics than they are. They have to win in swing seats in the 905. Um, they have to win swing seats in Vancouver. Um, they need, and, and politicians want to win elections more than anything, uh, kind of the overriding theme of, of, of electoral politics. And so incentives matter. Uh, and so unless those incentives change, I, I, don't, I don't see it happening. Interesting. What about the impacts of the of a potential economic recession, and what would those impacts have on the future of democracy, the trust in public institutions, and also polarization in Canada? And maybe Scott, if I'll throw that to you first. Well, I mean, I would just sort of, uh, at the risk of rehearsing what I said earlier, I mean, I think recessions are the kinds of uh, events in the social world that bring people together, uh, not in a good way, uh, I suppose, but, um, you know, it, when uh, a recession, uh, particularly uh, like around 2008, for instance, which was a really profound uh, economic disruption, when these kinds of events happen, uh, partisans uh, tend 
all to recognize and agree that it's happening. We have lots of evidence that that was the case in, uh, well, I, I have some evidence for Canada, but uh, in the US and in the UK, um, there's there's plenty of evidence of this. In, in, in the 2008 presidential election, when the uh, Lehman Brothers uh, collapsed, uh, in, the, in, the, in the final phase of the campaign, when politics was at its height, most polarized, um, the Lehman Brothers uh, collapse uh, led to uh, essentially a convergence, about three quarters of the difference between Republicans and Democrats on the state of the economy uh, disappeared in the, in the space of weeks. Um, so I think from the perspective of polarization, um, and if polarization is a bad thing, recessions are, are a good thing. I know that's a perverse thing to sort of say, but I think it's true. Um, now, of course, that's kind of the uh, immediate effect uh, of a recession. In the long run, if, re if recessions introduce a, a, a kind of politics of retrenchment, then I think we're in uh, the medium term looks uh, not so good. Um, and, and I think political conflicts may become intensified uh, under those circumstances. Um, of course, the you know, recession in the U.S. was followed by the, you know, the last uh, six years of the Obama presidency, which were very divisive and set up very well the Trump, even more divisive Trump presidency. I mean, that, that's one thing I want to say about American politics is the argument about polarization has been going on since, you know, the late 80s. The early 2000s, there was already this huge, you know, literature on polarization and, and fierce debates going on. Uh, is it polarizing? Is it not uh, in the U.S.? Um, I, I remember reading a book in about 2000, 2008 that talked about George Bush being the most polarizing president in history. And uh, it couldn't possibly get worse. Then President Obama became <laughs> president and the same story. And then Trump, good Lord. So um, anyway, it's all to say that this is a, a really long run um, sort of phenomenon. I kind of lost track of what point I was making there. But no, I, 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 I think yeah. the, the, the one thing that, that Scott raised, I think is crucial there, like the recession might be, might not, might have depolarizing effects. And like, and we can see that with the COVID-19 pandemic too, uh, you know, economic collapse, um, but government responded with a lot of measures to support individuals that had very massive cross-partisan consensus. I, I have some I have some work that shows that people took a, a, a very collectivist tone uh, early on in the pandemic through the, their, their support for government redistribution. Um, what's crucial is the aftermath of, of the recession. Um, some people recover faster than others. Um, there's important inequities there. Um, and so, you know, after the financial crisis, after the COVID-19, after the, the fiscal supports kind of ended for the COVID-19 pandemic and things started to return to normal, some returned to normal faster than others. Uh, some people were left holding the bag. Um, and that's where, where the tensions really emerged. And, and, and I think, you know, the, you know, with, with housing costs and all that, there, there is like an intergenerational tension now in, in Canadian politics that maybe hasn't been this acute before. And so that, that might be something to watch. So while recessions might not polarize their aftermath might, might play an important, might play some role. Really interesting. I know we're, we're pretty much at time, but I have to ask one more question because I think it kind of wraps it up for all of us who are watching, most of whom are our public servants. And so maybe if I can ask both Scott and Eric, your views just in, you know, a sentence or two, what do you think, what role do you think the public service, so that's us, right? We're separate from government, we're the, the public servants. What role do you think public servants actually have in managing the national perception of the state of polarization and extreme beliefs, et cetera? And uh, Scott? Sure. Uh, well, I, I um, maybe I'll go back to the point that uh, both Eric and I were sort of making earlier. There, there's something about the the quality of the political discourse that we have in this country uh, that I think public servants can be important in shaping, especially when they're allowed to communicate directly with Canadians, which hasn't always been the case. Uh, but when they're allowed to do that, uh, and, and of course, in, at all times, they're producing uh, uh, 
uh, you know, information uh, for for the for you know that shapes how we understand our country. And I think you know, remaining committed to the, you know the kind of dispassionate uh, values, recognizing the the existence of a plurality of values and perspectives in this country. We're, you know, a deeply diverse uh, country in, in a number of ways. Uh, and I think that uh, as long as the public service is reflecting that through its recruitment, certainly, and through uh, the way it interacts with Canadian society, then I think it's probably doing most of its job as far as polarization is concerned. Anything you want to add, Eric? Yeah, just just that, you know, People listen when civil servants talk, especially at the higher levels. And, you know, when we saw through the pandemic, um, civil servants taking a very active role, communicating to the public, through the media, uh, and people listened uh, and they and they care what they had to say. And, and their messages are more likely to be seen as credible than coming from a political party and, and the like. And so, so there is a communication role for civil servants. It's, it's, and, and that's likely to be even more important if they're, if they're able to kind of tap into unifying themes with, with their messaging, like, like, like Canadians as a whole, reminding people of their common citizenship, um, those sorts of things that, that bring people together. Um, I think there was, there was a lot of good in, in what uh, the civil service did through the pandemic, not just the federal level, provincial levels, probably even more important for some of the policies that were made. Um, but, but that, that all matters. And, 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 and just because Canadians are polarizing doesn't mean that suddenly those things don't matter. Yeah. Well, we are at time. I know we could talk about this for days because the, the research, the data that you've shown us, your perspectives, uh, very fascinating. Definitely a lot for us to think about. And I'll say the same thing I said at the beginning, which is, you know, we as public servants absolutely need this data. We need to understand it better. We need to know what is actually happening out there with Canadians so that we can make the right policies and provide the right recommendations uh, to to government and um, make sure that we're, we're using the right assumptions and not the wrong ones. So thank Thank you so much, Eric and Scott. It was great talking to you. I want to thank all of our participants across the country who have joined us today. I also invite you to participate and register for our next session in the Future of Democracy. Uh, it's the third event on national identity and challenges of the democratic cooperation. So that's going to be on October 20th. You can certainly register through the Canada School of Public Service website. You'll learn about the ways in which government policies can foster a uniquely democratic sense of national belonging and in turn strengthen the trust of citizens in the government and of each other, which is another important topic, that topic of public trust that we've talked about uh, over the last few months as well. So thank you once again for allowing us to be a part of your day and for all of our participants, I challenge you to share a bit of what you've learned today with a colleague or somebody in your life so that we we can continue this important conversation. Thank you and goodbye.